We were talking last time about the extraordinary conflict between man and nature, which exists among almost all highly civilized peoples, and especially here in the Western world, where we talk so much about our conquest of nature, our mastery of space, our subjection of the physical world. And I think one of the main reasons why we feel in this particular way is that each individual experiences himself as a peculiarly separate being. In other words, every man thinks of this world as a collection of objects. The world is a lot of things, and each person considers himself as a thing. And I wonder if you've ever stopped to ask yourself what a thing is and why you think you are a thing. Are you quite sure that you are a thing? Because if we take a look at ourselves from another point of view, for example, like this, we shall find that we are not one thing at all. We're an extraordinary number of things. But what you're looking at there is the cell structure of your own body. A whole multitude of tiny, tiny little individuals. And now, we might ask again, what other points of view could we take to ourselves? We could, of course, take the sociologist's point of view, where we are not really a thing at all, but a sub-member of a group. Or still more, if a man visiting us from another planet in something like a flying saucer were to hover down and look at what sort of creature is inhabiting this Earth, what would he see? Let's take a look and get some idea of his view. This is the kind of creature he would find inhabiting this planet. A sprawly, nubbly thing with various lines connecting with it. That would be, in his view, the kind of thing that or well, you see, how many things we are depends upon the point of view which one takes. Every point of view that we've taken, the point of view of the cells, the point of view of the man hovering above the earth in a flying saucer or an aeroplane, is a correct point of view. And according to the way in which we look, so we divide the things of the world. Or well, you see, it's interesting, isn't it, that the word thing is very like the word think. Because by breaking down our world into things is the way in which we think about it. We break down what we call uh, the material world into objects and assign to those objects the kind of words we describe as now. And then the world of action we break into events and assign to events the kind of world of words all verbs. But things and events are fundamentally the ways of breaking up our complex world so that we can think about it. I wonder if any of you have ever been to a psychologist and taken a rock test and been asked to look at one of these extraordinary blocks. Now, actually, the block that we're looking at here isn't a real Rorschach block because you're not allowed to show them in public in case people saw them before the test. But they're something like this. And they're made by splodging ink on paper and folding the paper over so that you get a symmetrical block. And the psychologist says to you when you look at that, now, please, will you tell me a story about it? What do you think it looks like? And you might say, well, I think it looks like a great big cat face. Or maybe it's a woman's handbag. Or maybe it's a dancer waving his arms in front of a pair of pine trees with some rocks around. All sorts of stories you can invent about it, anything you like. And the psychologist will use the kind of information that you've given you, the sort of things that you project out of your own mind into that blot, and he will then form some diagnosis. But you see, he's not interested in the information that you give him about the blot as a description. 
He's interested in what you say as a description of what is going on inside you. In other words, what you are saying about that block is a projection of yourself into its strange and complicated conformations. Now you see, our whole world is in many ways not so very much unlike this peculiar block. And you might think that there might be some persuasive person who stands up and gives a story about the blot of the world. And other people agree with what he says. He says, look here, that's a mountain, that's a tree, that's a rock. And everybody else would agree because he was so persuasive. And we would all beginning, be beginning to give the same story about the cosmic Rorschach plot. Because after all, our world is a very wiggly affair. Consider, for example, cloud. or clouds with mountains across them, or waters or stars. All the world is a wiggly affair. Not at all unlike that block we were looking at. We have to find out ways of making sense of it. Perhaps one of the things that men first, one of the strangest, the most difficult to understand things that men first began to make sense of in this kind of Rorschach blot interpretation way were the stars in heaven. And one of the ways in which they did this was to project upon the skies figures of all kinds of mythological monsters and beasts, such as the idea of a dipper for the great bear, those stars in the great bear that look, you know, like a ladle, or some people call them the plow, or here, perhaps on a celestial sphere of this kind, you can see quite clearly the outline of the constellation Leo, the lion, a lion drawn in the sky, so that men could find their way about in the stars, recognize their outlines by associating certain groups of stars with familiar images. But you see, this is fundamentally a projection of ideas out of our own minds onto nature. Nature itself will take all kinds of different projections, and no one is necessarily the right one. They work for us so long as we agree about it. That is, so long as we abide by convention. And in Indian philosophy, the fundamental word for this kind of thing is the Sanskrit term, Maya. I'm going to write that down. Maya. And this word comes from a root in the Sanskrit language. Ma. And the word ma is at the basis of all kinds of words that we use in our own tongue. It's at the basis of matter of the Latin mater or mother, at the basis of matrix or metric, because the fundamental meaning of the root ma is to measure. And so it works in this sort of way. I was talking about our world being weak. You know, something like this. That is the typical sort of shape that we are having to deal with all the time. And I think you'll see at once that a shape like that is extraordinarily difficult to talk about. If I were talking on the radio at the moment and not on television, I would have the greatest difficulty in describing that line to you in such a way that you could write it down on a piece of paper in front of you without seeing it. But here you can see it and you can understand it at once. 
But it isn't enough just to be able to see things. We want to be able to talk about them. We want to be able to describe them exactly so that we can control them and deal with them. I mean, supposing this were the outline of a piece of territory on a map, then you might want to tell someone an exact spot to which he should go. And then you would have to be far more precise about it than you could be when you just get the general idea of it by looking at it. And so we introduce then the idea of Maya by essentially doing this. This might be called a matrix. A line crossed, lines crossed by line in a very formal, simple pattern. And the moment we do that, it becomes very easy indeed to talk about this wiggly line. Because we could, for example, number all these squares across. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. We can also number them downwards. And then in terms of numbers across and numbers down, we can indicate the exact points on this grid which cross the wiggly line. And by numbering those points, one after another, we can give an accurate description of the way that line moves. And furthermore, supposing the line under our grid were not still like this one, but supposing it was wiggling uh, in motion, supposing it was a flea or something dipped in ink, it was crawling across the paper, and we wanted to know where he was going to go, all we would have to do would be to plot out the positions which he has covered and then we could calculate statistically a trend which would indicate where he would be likely to go next. And if he went there next, we should say, by Jove, isn't that incredible? This little flea crawling across the paper is obeying the laws of statistics. Well, as a matter of fact, it isn't. What he is doing is, or rather I should say, what, not what he is doing, but what we are doing is we are making a very, very abstract model of the way in which that line is shaped or in which that flea is crawling. We are breaking it up into little bits, whereas in fact it is not a lot of little bits. It is a continuous sweep. But by treating it in this way as if it were broken up into bits, we are measuring it, we are making a maya and these cross lines are a Maya, just in the same way as the idea of the lion, the Leo constellation in the stars is a Maya. A way of projecting. You see, this thing, it comes out of our mind, and we project it upon nature like this. And break nature into bits so that it can be easily talked about and handled. But you see, this tends to give us the that our world is a lot of it, and that things are really separate from each other. You see, how could I demonstrate how this is? I have an idea, Mr. Cameron. Will you focus the camera on one small, tiny spot in the set and come very close to it and travel along bit by bit by bit by bit? Now you see, this is looking at the world, little bit by little bit, as if we were only using the central vision of our eyes, the kind of vision we use for reading the close work of that kind. But if this were the only way we had of looking at things, it would be very difficult to make any sense of life at all, because we would see everything in series, bit after bit after bit. But fortunately, we are also able to enlarge the whole view and take in everything at once in a single sweep. And you see, this shows all the advantages and the disadvantages of looking at things in the way that Indian philosophy calls Maya. Because if Maya were the only way we had to look at things, we should only be able to understand one thing at a time. And our world is not just one thing happening, one after another, one at a time. Our world is an enormous volume, a great vastness, 
in which everything is happening all together at once. Now, being able to think of things one at a time is extraordinarily useful because this is what enables us to have science, to have scientific control of nature, to be able to count things, measure them, manage them, and predict their behavior in the future. But it is inclined to run away with it and give us the impression that if we think too hard about it, or if we put too much faith in things, that the world is made up of a lot of separate bits so that we have a kind of bit-by-bit -bit approach to nature, what I might call a putt-putt-putt-putt view of life. It's useful, indeed, to break things down into things and to classify them. But the moment it gives us the impression that these little bits into which we have divided the world are really and in nature separate from each other, we get into confusion. Now, how do we know that divided things aren't really separate. Look, for example, at me. How do you know I? How can you make out the outline of my body? Isn't it because there is a contrast between the background behind me and my figure? You know where the background ends and I begin, and so you are able to see me. But now what would happen if the background should vanish and disappear? And I would no longer be there but the figure in the ground instead would be my butt. In order to see me, you have to see a background along with me. And so, if we go back and look again at the whole thing, then we can see once again. Now, what does that tell us? Surely, the thing that it tells us is not merely that The background is one thing, and the figure is another. Since the two must go together, it indicates that there is a connection. If you can't have the perception of a figure without a background, if you simply cannot see it, if there is no background there, doesn't that mean that the background and the figure are some way separate? They're different here, but they're inseparable. Take, for example, a coin. When you uh, have a coin, it has two sides, head and tail. And these two sides are indeed different. They, you might say, they are separate sides. But what would happen if we take a file and start rubbing away to get rid of one of the sides? Well, we would rub and rub and rub, and when we finally got rid of the side, the other side would have vanished too, because the two sides of the coin go together. Yes, they are different, but they are also separate. And this is true of almost everything, because we distinguish things from their background. We distinguish one side from another as we distinguish up and down. I imagine what would happen if we arranged everything in the set or tried to arrange everything, so that nothing were down, everything had to be up. If we could really, in nature, separate the up and down, why we couldn't do it? Because up goes with down, is unintelligible apart from down, in the same way that the head side of a coin goes together with the tail side. And so, in this way, we, as individuals, as separate beings, are really inseparable from the whole natural environment in which we live. We go together, and you cannot have the one without the other. Without what we call things, there would be no world. But without what we would call the whole world, there would be no thing. And this is not only true of what we call things, objects. It's also true of many of our experiences. Let's take, for example, one of the most fundamental distinctions of experience, what is pleasant and what is not. Now, a great many people are bending the whole effort of their lives to have pleasure and get rid of pain. This 
pursuit of pleasure is regarded as the fundamental aim of human existence. And you know when you start to read old books on Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, they very often say that the first thing a man must understand is to give up the pursuit of pleasure. And people who read these things think that these are very bright and Puritans, people who have a sour attitude to life, who burnt their fingers in the game of the pursuit of pleasure and say, well, let's not get mixed up with that anymore. But as a matter of fact, this is a, just a plain, clear, sensible statement. It's like saying, you cannot have up without down. You cannot have a figure without a background. And in the same way exactly, you cannot experience pleasure unless there is something to be done. You know what happens when a person who longs to make a great deal of money all his life. And he makes it. Finally, he gets a million dollars. He thinks this is the answer. Well, it's fine. Just in the moment of transition, while he's going from poverty to richness. But when he's had his million dollars for a few months, everything adjusts. And he begins to feel just the same as he always felt before. Conversely, if some of you have lived near a tannery or near a uh, public utility place like a gas producing factory, you get so used to the bad smell in the background that you cease to notice it. It becomes the normal smell. And so you don't notice it anymore as the bad smell. For both the bad and the good need each other as contrast. And therefore, When we try to get rid of one of the pair and possess the other only, we do something that is profoundly nonsensical. We think we can do it because in Maya, that is to say, in conventional thinking, in terms of that kind of measurement that we call thought, we can separate the one from the other. We can talk about up as different from down. We can talk about one thing as different from other things. But in actual experience, it can't be done. Just as in actual experience, that wiggly line was a continuous line and not a series of points. And in another way too, we can't really pursue pleasure. Because pleasure, is something that has to come to us. For example, <coughs> you can pursue a cow. You can go out and catch it and kill it and serve it up as steak. That you can do. But you can't pursue the pleasure that you get from eating steak. If, in other words, you try to get pleasure out of steak, supposing I sit here and I have a great big splendid steak served to me, and I say, this is the best steak I ever ate, why it's a Chateau Briand, and it costs $12 a plate, and therefore I must make the very maximum effort to enjoy it, and I cut the thing up, and I put it in my mouth, and say, now, I've really got to get the most out of this piece of steak. And so I chew it with all my might to get the very best out of it. And what happens? I'm making so much muscular strain. I'm trying so hard get something out of it, that I frustrate the very pleasure that it should give. Why? Surely it is because pleasure is a function of nerves, and you can't make an effort with your nerves. Catching a cow is a function of muscles, and you can make an effort with your muscles. To give another illustration of the same thing, first thing I want to see an object in the garden. I want to make out the time on this clock. Now my eyes are nervous rather than muscular. And if I strain my eyes very hard to make out what is way off the clock, what happens? All the images of the figures on the clock will fuzz. But if I relax and let the image come to it, as light does in fact come to the eyes, then I can see the image clearly. So, 
When we think of the world as consisting primarily of a lot of disconnected things, and ourselves as one, so that we go out and get them, or we can push those things around soon. We forget so easily that the entire system of nature, ourselves and the people, is interconnected in every conceivable way. You know what happens when you think, well, we've got a lot of mosquitoes around here. All kinds of insects bite us and bother us. Let's get rid of them. So we bring in the DDT and we send an aeroplane over and spray the whole surrounding territory with DDT. And what happens? Suddenly we find that other insects or other pests which those insects we destroyed were feeding upon multiply and increase. And we have new problems. We have to get rid of those, like when they brought rabbits into Australia because they thought they'd be useful there for some reason or other. The rabbits multiplied because there's nothing that fed on rabbits. Then they had a plague of rabbits. You see, you cannot just push nature around. You cannot regard it as something to be attacked so that you can grab bits from it and shove it around any old way as if it were a machine that you could bang around like a mechanic. Indeed, even machines, as any good mechanic knows, are not that simple to play with. But if we do not see that our view of the separateness of the world is based on a convention of thinking, it exists, as it were, in here. It doesn't exist out here in actual concrete reality. And if we are confused, then we jump, follow our thoughts instead of our senses. I suppose most of you are familiar with this old optical illusion. You're asked the question, which of the three thick black lines is the longer. And I suppose one's natural reaction is to say the one on the left. And I think you know that this is a result of the illusion of perspective. An illusion with which we are so used, to which we are so used, and by which we are so easily fooled once we've accustomed ourselves to it. We might, if that picture were drawn more vividly, even be predisposed to thinking that was a real passage stretching away from you with doors at the end. Of course, if you came up against that kind of thing painted against the wall, you might make the mistake of walking into it and banging your nose. But this is an example of what we were talking about last time as Maya, that word from Indian philosophy which generally has the meaning of illusion. Or rather, illusions brought about by the acceptance of certain conventions of which perspective is an example. When we are not aware that certain things which we take for granted, like the separateness of each the things from each other, when we are not aware that this is a matter of convention, we are apt to be fooled. Now, I think one of the conventions by which we tend to be fooled more than almost any other is time. And for all human beings, time is a matter of extraordinary importance. And perhaps this is one of the principal ways in which we differ from animals. Because man has been called a time-binding animal. That is to say, a creature who is vividly aware of the fact that his life moves, as it were, along a line from the past through the present and into the future. Animals apparently live pretty much moment by moment. They don't appear to have very strong memories, but because man has a strong memory, he is able to bear the past in mind and, as it were, 
cast it forward into visions of the future based upon what has happened in the past. And therefore, although this facility gives man the most extraordinary ability to plan his life, to prepare for future eventuality, at the same time, there is a very heavy price which he pays for it, and especially if he takes this ability too seriously. In other words, if he doesn't realize that the true reality in which he lives is the present moment now. For example, the animal probably doesn't concern itself very much with problems of future disease, death, or starvation, and things of that kind. If, another an if an animal sees another dead animal lying around, I don't suppose he thinks to himself, well, one day that's going to happen to me. Rather, he just sees a dead animal, sniffs it, sees if it's, whether it's good to eat, and wanders away. But for human beings, it's entirely different. Because we actually spend most of our time and a great deal of our emotional energy living in time which is not here, living in an elsewhere which is not concretely real. So much so that although we may be quite comfortable and happy in our present circumstances, if there is not a guarantee, not a promise, of a good time coming tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, we are at once unhappy, even in the midst of pleasure and affluence. And so we develop a kind of chronic anxiety about time. We want to be sure more and more because of our sensitivity to the feeling of time. We want to be sure more and more that our future is assured. And for this reason, the future becomes of more importance to most human beings than the present. And in this sense, we are hooked, taken in by a Maya because it is of very little use to us to be able to control and plan the future unless we are capable at the same time of living totally in the present. And so, when in civilized societies we spend so much of our time living for the future, we become very much like those celebrated donkeys, you know, that have a uh, carrot fastened on a stick that's tied to the neck, you know, behind here, and it comes over, and there's the carrot dangling in front of it. They pursue it, pursue it, pursue it, but could never reach it. And so in exactly the same way, it's that way with us. My goodness, don't you remember when you went first to school? You went to kindergarten. And in kindergarten, the idea was to push along so that you could get into first grade. And then push along so that you could get into second grade, third grade, so on, going up and up. And then you went to high school, and this was a great transition in life. And now the pressure is being put on. You must get ahead. You must go up the grades and finally be good enough to get to college. And then when you get to college, you're still going step by step, step by step, up to the great moment in which you're ready to go out into the world. And then when you get out into this famous world, comes the struggle for success in professional offices. And again, there seems to be a ladder before you, something for which you're reaching all the time. And then, suddenly, when you're about 40 or 45 years old in the middle of life, you wake up one day and say, Huh? I've arrived. And by Jove, I feel pretty much the same as I've always felt. In fact, I'm not so sure that I don't feel a little bit cheated. Because you see, you were fooled. You were always living for somewhere where you aren't. And while, as I said, it is of tremendous use for us to be able to look ahead in this way, there is no use planning for a future, which when you get to it and it becomes the present, you won't be there. You'll be living in some other future which hasn't yet arrived. And so in this way, one is never able actually to inherit and enjoy the fruits of one's action. You can't live at all unless you can live fully now. And because now is never satisfactory, because we're never really living in it, we get more and more avid to go ahead and see the future. We develop our technology, technology to a fantastic ability where we can more and more fulfill our desires for the future almost immediately. 
working towards a sort of push button world. But have you ever stopped to think what the world would be like if you could fulfill every wish the moment you wish? Suppose, for example, on going to bed at night, you could always dream whatever you wanted to dream. What would happen? Of course, I suppose at first, you would dream fantastic pleasures, wonderful adventures, fulfillment of all the things you ever wished. Then as time went on, don't you think you'd want to be, oh, a little bit surprised, have a little bit less control over what would happen to you? And after you'd experimented with this for some months or years, you might even want dreams in which you suffer. Because there is no real delight, no real fulfillment without delay. Doesn't every child know on a hot day, you think I'm terribly thirsty and I'd like an ice cream soda. Haven't you tried the experiment of putting off drinking it, putting off so that you get thirstier and thirstier and it's so much fun when you finally get to it? So in the same way, impatience with time, always wanting the future, is frustrating. Now you know, in Indian thought, one of the basic myths or ideas is of Brahma, the world creator, who has infinite power and has everything that he wants. But he is like our dream, and he wants to do something with the infinite time of his disposal. And therefore, what he does is to dream, just like that, to dream the existence of the world. And he does it over enormous and incalculable periods of time, dreaming that he is the knower, the self, in every single creature that exists in the world, dreaming them all at once, experiencing their joys and sorrows, completely plunging himself into the adventure of forgetting who he is. But he does this for immense and vast periods, rivaling in conception the latest modern astronomical idea of the extent of time. You know, the basic reckoning period of time in the life of Brahma the Creator is called a kalpa. And that is a period of 4,320,000 years. And the Kalpas are called the days of Brahma. One day for Brahma's life is a Kalpa. And so there are the periods which you can call his days or nights, whichever you wish, where he goes into dream and he dreams the world. And then for the following Kalpa, he wakes up and realizes who he is again and then he dreams again, going on and on and on through years of kalpas, the 360 days and nights of Brahma, centuries of kalpas, endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. For the Hindu doesn't think of time in quite the same way that we do. Obviously, we think of time as linear, day after day after day after day, going along the line. Or sometimes we like to think of time as this sort of line, going up and up and up and up and up and up and getting better and better and better. But that's not the fundamental idea of time for almost any people in the world outside of Western civilization. In nearly every other part of the world, time is thought of as a circle. And they say, after all, isn't it reasonable for it to be a circle? Look at your watch. Doesn't your watch go round and round? But the Hindus not only think of time as cycling, going round and round and round forever, just as the earth cycles round and around the sun. They also think of it in another quite fundamentally different way from our conception of time. I referred to this idea that's common among us, that time is going up and up and things are getting better and better. But in the general Hindu view, in every cycle of time, things tend on the whole 
will get worse and worse. They divide the Kalpa into a number of shorter periods, each of which is called a Yuga. But the Yugas are so arranged that there are four of them in what is called a Maha Yuga or Great Yuga. The first one occupying this period is the longest. The second one occupies a shorter period, here to here. The third, still shorter than the second. The fourth, the shortest of all. And the names that are given to them are the names of the throws in the Indian game of dice. The best throw, the throw of four, is called Frita. And that lasts for the longest time. It is a golden age where everything is just fine. The next one is called Treta, the throw of three. Pretty good, but not quite so good. The third is called Dvapara, the throw of two. And here, good and evil are equally balanced, not so hot. The final throw, the throw of one, is called Kali. The worst throw, that's the shortest period, and of course, according to Hindu ideas, we're living in it now. But in Kali Yuga, everything goes to pieces and becomes dreadful. And time goes fast. Now, why do they feel that time deteriorates? It is because as one lives in time and becomes more and more conscious of time, we tend more and more to pursue the future, as I said a little while ago. And as we pursue the future, Present time becomes more and more unsatisfactory, and we feel that we have to chase our happiness at greater and greater speed. I was talking the other day to a college president who said, you know, I'm so busy now that I'm going to have to get a helicopter. I said, whatever you do, don't do it, because if you get it, more will be expected of you. You'll be expected to go to more places faster. And you see, in this whole problem of speed, of getting advantages in life because we can move about rapidly, we forget that speed is only of real advantage to you. If you're the only person who has it, then you can get ahead of other people. But the minute everybody else catches up with you, you're all back where you were, only going much faster and much more nervous. Going, as it were, faster and faster to less and less desirable objectives. We hurry everything we do. We make our products, our houses, our furniture, our clothes, so that they become obsolete quickly. We're in such a hurry to get everything done. We pay attention to the front rather than the back. Who, for example, in this day and age, has time to do anything like this? Here's a piece of Chinese embroidery. Those among you who've ever done any embroidery, some of the ladies, will no doubt recognize that this is a kind of stitch called needlepoint. It's done on a material made up of minute little squares of thread, like a grid or lattice thread. And this work here is so minute that there are 1,024 stitches per square inch. So well done, furthermore, that if you turn it over and look at the back, the back is almost as neat as the front. You know, ordinarily when you embroider, you take shortcuts around the back and take threads, uh, jumping spaces and tie knots and things of that kind. But here, no hurry. Or take such an ordinary object as a lady's pocketbook. This again is Chinese embroidery work in shaded silk. Very patiently done over a padded base underneath so that the figures stand out. And inside it, a little sewing case, which opens up, 
showing concealed within. Place to the scissors, but the most delicate work. But in this day and age, we don't have time for it. Because we are always in a hurry to get things finished. And so the things that we finish weren't worth finishing because they were done so fast. After all, the enjoyment of our world is not really unlike listening to music. We don't play music in order to get something. I mean, if the objective of music were to arrive at a point, say the last bar, the final great crashing chords of the symphony, well, then all we'd do, we'd be just hurry up its playing, play it as fast as possible so as to get to the culmination, the end, as soon as possible. Or just cut out the whole symphony and play only the last bar. To be able to enjoy it, we have got to live each moment of the play and listen to it as if it were the only thing important to listen to. And then if we do that, our time has an entirely different quality. It's represented in a Buddhist saying that spring does not become the summer. There is spring and then there is summer. Firewood does not turn into ashes. There is first firewood, then there are ashes. The two stages being, as it were, sufficient by themselves. And this is intended to give the idea of living in a fully concrete present into which you settle in. I mean, the present for most of us is, isn't it, just a hairline on a dial. The hand goes by it flash, and there's nothing in it, one after another. But here there is an entirely different sense of it, as something you can settle into. There's a line behind me from a Chinese poet. And it says, literally, day, ditto. In other words, day, day, that is good day. Every day is a good day. And it comes as the last line of this poem. In spring, hundreds of flowers. In summer, refreshing breeze. In autumn, the moon. Free your mind from idle thoughts. And for you, every season is a good season. Every day is a good day. And idle thoughts mean illusory thoughts of pursuing a future thoughts of making one's happiness depend on something which isn't here at all but when one can come to realize that the present is the only place in which you live and that the past and the future are now no more than useful, still useful, useful only if one can live. Then, as I say, one can set in full participation with the momentary reality of life as it goes along life. So, in the art of the Far East, there is exactly the kind of delight in momentary one can really consider, for example, this stem of a broken bamboo. Or, not only in painting, but in poetry, a poem in the Japanese haiku style, poems which just crystallize a single moment. In the dark forest, a berry bump sounds important. Or a painting of a man sitting all alone in his boat, listening to the water. He's not asleep. He's not dreaming. 
He's a man living in an entirely real world, a world which we neglect because we have no time to sit and listen to what. After all, are not the memories which you go over, memories which persuade you that it's really worth being alive, really memories of certain moments in which life itself brought you completely away. I know we all think of things like the smell of coffee and bacon on an autumn morning, the smell of burning leaves. I remember particularly for me one glimpse of a flock of sunlit pigeons against the dark background of the sun. And it's infinitely like that that are very largely celebrated in Far Eastern art and poetry. Perception of the full reality and intensity such a one as this. The sea dark, the voices of the wild duck are faint and white. A brushwood gate, and for a lock, this snake. Or paintings where one sees just a few birds on a branch. So, vi so vividly alive that you somehow think the next time you look at the branch, birds won't be there. This is all an art form possible for people who feel themselves to be living in this real momentary world. I remember once a very wise man who used to give lectures on philosophical matters at this time. Before he started giving any lectures, would sit for a while looking at his audience. And then quite suddenly he would say, Wake up! You're all fast asleep. And if you don't wake up, I won't give any lecture. And another Chinese sage pointed one day to some flowers while talking to a friend and said, most people look at these as if they were in a dream. And Buddha, one of the wisest of the sons of Asia, his real name was Gotama, but he was called Buddha because Buddha means the awakening the man who woke up. Now in what sense was he awake? He was awake in the sense that he was completely all here. After all, we say about a person who's nuts, he's not all here. He's not all there. But our whole culture, our whole civilization, in so far as it is involved with time, living only for a future, is nuts. It's not all here. We are not awake. We are not completely alive now. And consequently, we are so hungry and so greedy because everything seems fake. We are living for an abstraction which has not yet come to be. And we don't know what really is. I remember once I uh, I was looking in the open air and one of those glorious little thistle down things came and I picked it up like that and brought it down and it looked as if it was struggling to get away just as if you caught an insect by one leg like a daddy long leg or something of that kind it seemed to be struggling to get away and I, at first I thought well it's not doing that that's just the wind blowing then I thought again really? Only the wind blowing? Surely, it is the structure of this thing, which in cooperation with the existence of wind, 
enables it to move like an animal, but using the wind's effort, not its own. It is more intelligent being than an insect, in a way, because an insect uses effort, like a person who rows a boat uses effort, but the man who puts up a sail is using magic. He lets nature do it for him with the intelligence to use a sail. See? So in just this way, there's the meaning of, of uh, death is that kind of intelligence which, without your using very much effort, gets everything to cooperate with you. You, for example, never force other people to agree with you but you give them the notion that the idea you wanted them to have was their own. This is a feminine heart, preeminently. A, a woman who really wants a lover does not pursue him, because then most men feel that she's aggressive, and if she's aggressive, she obviously is a woman who has had difficulty in finding lovers. Therefore, there must be some undesirably secret thing about her. But if she, as it were, makes a void, then, uh, and, and is slightly difficult to get, then people get excited. They know she's a highly prized object, and uh, so they pursue. Same way, when you want to teach a baby to swim, you could, the thing you can do is to put the baby in the water, and then, uh, move backwards in the water and create a vacuum and this pulls the baby along. This helps it to learn the feel of the water and how to swim. It's the same principle. So, uh, also, clever, difficult to getness is one of the very best means of acquiring immense publicity. Let's take the case of T.E. Lawrence, who published The Seven Pillars of Wisdom in a limited edition. And uh, this was a, became an extraordinarily celebrated book. It cost hundreds of dollars a copy to find one you know, on the market. They waited and waited and built this up and built this up and built this up. And finally, they published a general edition. And it was a knockout because the first, the first one had been sort of secret and uh, difficult to find. <laughs> if you have patience, you see, you can always do that. Uh, so, the whole art of the ruler, you see, the, the Tao Te Ching is a book written for several purposes. You may take it as a guide to mystical understanding of the universe. You may take it as a dissertation on the principles of nature, almost a naturalistic uh, a, a handbook of natural law, we would say. Or you may also take it as a political book, a book of wisdom for governance. And the principle which it advocates, basically, is the virtue of governing by not ruling. Uh, look at it in this way. Supposing the President of the United States were as unknown to you by name as the local uh, sanitary inspector, the man who looks after the drains and the sewage disposal and all that kind of thing. This is not a glamorous figure, you see. But for that very reason, he probably does his job more efficiently than the president. Because the president wastes an enormous amount of time in interviewing various groups from uh, uh, the Elks and the Girl Scouts and uh, conferring uh, honors and all this kind of thing. The poor man's life must be an utter torment because he's so well known and therefore has absolutely no time to give to the government of the country. <laughs> I mean, think of his mail uh, and all the people who have to be employed sifting that out and assessing it. So that if he were someone quite anonymous, and that we didn't have to think about, he would be a very, very good ruler. 
in just the same way, for example, you don't have to attend, unless you're sick, to the government of your own body. It happens automatically. This is this expression, Ziran, of itself, and uh, it goes on day after day after day, and the, the better it is, the less you have to think about it. When you see well, you do not see your eyes. If there is something wrong with your eyes, you start seeing spots, and those spots are spots in your eyes. When you hear well, you'd never hear your ears. But when they start singing, you know, then you're starting to hear your ears, and your ears are getting in the way of their own hearing. <laughs>